Hello everyone, it's uh, Steve Barrett here, Editor-in-Chief of PR Week. We're about to record our weekly podcast. Uh, our guest this week is Brett Werner from MWW and our Chief Client Officer. Delighted to have Brett with us. We've got Frank Washkirk, who's our News Editor, and we're going to start recording our podcast soon. If you've got any comments on what we talk about, if you want to say how brilliant the content is, if you want to tell us how we can do better, then please do append a comment and uh, we'll try and respond to that and uh, try and... Uh, Incorporate that into the show, but for now we're just going to start start the official recording. Guys, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Brett. Always a pleasure to have you on board. Hello and welcome to the PR Week. PR Week's regular weekly roundup of everything that matters in the world of PR and communications. My name's Steve Barrett. I'm the editor in chief of PR Week guide you through the next 20-25 minutes as we pick up on topical issues with our news editor Frank Washkook. Hi Frank. Good to be here Steve. Yes it is. And um, how was election week without me? Oh it was very hectic. A few surprises you might say. Yeah there, it, there was a bit of stuff going on. I've been on vacation in Europe so I had an interesting take on it. And our special guest this week, Brett Werner from MWW. Brett, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you for having me. Chief, Chief Client Officer. Yes. It still seems a bit odd, not saying Brett from Catalyst, <laughs> but you've been at MWW for a little while. Just man. about a year yeah, now. So, year. Um, yes, it's been a, a great um, new role for me, my, my third chapter in the industry, and uh, great to be uh, with a very strong independent agency that has a diverse set of offerings. And, and for me, I've always felt the foundation of building an agency starts with great clients and doing great work. and that leads to organic growth, and you've done a great job of that this year. Good. Well, we'll get into that a bit more, and we're also going to pick up on reflections on the election, obviously. We talk about the new balance controversy. They decided to get involved in it, and they have uh, suffered some reputational issues there. We'll talk about fake news. How big an impact did that have, and, and what are the implications for PR pros? And also Facebook's metrics have come under scrutiny. And we'll talk about the NFL. The Ratings have been falling this season, so what, what does that say about the sport moving forward? So uh, let's start with, with you, Brett. So, yeah, you, you went through that whole process with Catalyst where you were involved right from the start, from the sort of founding it through to selling it. Um, what, what, would you learn, what did you learn from that, what, and what would you, did you take out of that into your next role? What were the big things you took out of it? Because that's a, an experience a lot of people are going through in some stage, isn't it? They're either in a startup where they, they aspire to do what you did, they're trying to grow their business to a stage where it might be attractive for sale, or they're then sort of doing that whole burnout or, or finishing up process. What, what would you sort of reflect on that looking back? Sure. So there are a lot of key learnings on there. I mean, I think we were fortunate that we formulated an agency that had a tip of the spear that was a subject matter expert on something. Uh, we also were an independent agency. We were able to grow at our own pace, to reinvest into the business, and, and luckily we worked with great brands, we did good work and evolved over time, uh, found a partner that we felt could further evolve uh, our business and were fortunate to be part of the IMG and William Morris family. So it was a great 11 year run from, from start to finish, but great clients and great talent solve a lot of problems. Yeah, you must have had people sniffing around the agency uh, all the time, especially in the PR sphere. So what was it that made you choose a a group like IMG, which obvious sort of match up on the sports and entertainment front. Sure, and, and ultimately things were moving and evolving so quickly. The the exit strategy was was never a huge focal point. It was just about growing the business and evolving. But at some point in your lifestyle, you realize there has to be an investment of capital or a partnership to further evolve, and that uh, is inevitable. So. Uh, you need to determine if you want to grow what decisions you make in that process. But there were a lot of key learnings. It was a, an incredible run, an incredible experience, and like I said, a, a chapter that I always look favorably upon, and uh, we were fortunate to uh, have a great run with some great people, take home some hardware from you guys along the way. And uh, That's right. Yeah. Uh, but again, we, we had a tip of the spear at that agency, and I think a smaller shop needs that to succeed. And then once you'd finished that chapter, you probably had a lot of offers. I think I know that you did, actually, or a lot of <laughs> potential opportunities. What was it that made you choose the MWW uh, option? Um, I really think that there's so much opportunity in our industry, and I've always gravitated to those um, sort of independent agencies. They're, they're not independent, independent-minded agencies, because I think in a changing landscape, that's vital right now. Uh, I also felt like I was intrigued that sort of 
well, I come from a consumer background, the consumer, the corporate, the public affairs, that's really blending together now and how people make decisions on what brands they buy or where they go in the world is influenced by a lot of different factors. So I was looking for a firm with sort of multifaceted offerings. And when you sort of put the equation of like-minded, independent, a lot of diverse offerings, the universe gets a lot smaller quickly. And I've had a lot of respect for Michael. I've known him for some time. Uh, and I really enjoyed my 11 months there with him. Yeah, that's Michael Kempner, the CEO, and he um, actually he had the experience of being part of a holding company at IPG and then buying the agency out of that. So do you think they will stay independent for the foreseeable now? Or will, I, that, will I, they ever go back into you know, a holding company? Ever is a long time, but for right now, independence is, is our avenue and our path, and we'd like to be able to reinvest in the company, grow new areas, <laughs> Um, and do it when we want to do it. So right now, we are an independent agency and very proud of that. So what does a chief client officer do? It's a, it's a great question, and as Michael and I had a lot in common and we spoke, you know, we, we shared this common belief that in the agency world, the client service aspect of this gets forgotten a lot, that it's always the chase for, for the next thing. So uh, we have eight offices around the globe. We have a multitude of offerings. Uh, we felt that we needed someone in there to help stitch all that together. Under one P&L, we can pull in San Francisco or the UK or digital or technology. It doesn't matter. Uh, so if I could help orchestrate all that, we could ensure that our client retention was even greater than it was. And the easiest wins in the agency business are the organic wins. You know, Do great work for great clients, and new business follows, too. And I think we've proven that out this year that we've been successful with that. But... To be honest, I think it's a title that should be in more agencies. Pretty much every agency has a new business person, but where's that person who's focusing on quality control, what's happening with our biggest opportunities or perhaps our biggest challenges, and making sure all these different offices are working in unison. Is it a problem that is not maybe, dire how directly is it linked to billings and actually billable hours? Is that why uh, more agencies don't do it, or can you actually link the role into specific clients? You, you could link it in. I, I think it's a little counterproductive if you do it that way. You, you have to believe that if you can orchestrate everything together within an agency that one plus one will equal three, and a lot of agencies don't do that. So it is a little bit of an investment hire we've, we've made in myself, too. I, I typically don't bill the majority of my time, too, but like I said, it, it pays dividends. If you can start each year with really strong retention, you can keep building on the agency. And finally, what, what's the biggest difference to working at MWW to being at Catalyst? Uh, it's a, just the, the diverse offerings that we have. We have an LGBT practice. We have a strong public affairs group. Uh, issues management and corporate is in the DNA of the company. So, again, I come from that consumer background. It's great to sit in a room with people from different backgrounds. We have people from politics. We have people from ad agencies. We have people from PR firms. Just a great mix and sort of collection of talent. Well, we wish you well, and uh, look forward to seeing how you do there. Great, and, thank um, you. Yeah, it's been a been a quick year. Let's segue into talking about the election because obviously Michael Kemper is a very high-profile supporter of the Democratic Party and fundraiser, and, and worked you know through the campaign was close to President Obama as well. I mean, what what was his thoughts on what happened last week, and and, and yours as well? Well, I won't speak on behalf of him, but I know that everyone w was surprised. Uh, with that said, I think when we turn this into how it reflects on the PR industry, I think uh, in, under the Trump administration, issues management will be a big growth area uh, for the PR industry, that lots of industries are gonna go through change or going through change as we speak. So if you have a strong issues management capability, you'll probably do well. Um, I think we, we talk a little bit that we feel that this will infuse the economy quickly, how long that's sustained for, who knows that answer to. But I think you'll see a lot of companies aggressively spending in different ways and will probably um, give a little bit of a lift to the PR industry that should be able to capitalize on that. How, um, how much soul searching is happening out there in the agency world about how marketers collect data and whether that data is actually accurate? I think it's a great point. I think what, what one of the key learnings we'll take away from this election is sort of the right brain and left brain. No matter how much we talk about analytics, there's always going to be a feel and a touch to this. So for every study we put in the marketplace of how people were votes, we got to see how many signs are in yards and communities too. And I think you can relate that to our profession that we're always going to be research and insights driven, but there's a feel, there's a gut reaction that hopefully your agency is bringing to you 
that has value too. And I don't think either people sort of go to one extreme or the other, and the answer is in the middle of how we can make decisions, build the best programs, uh, or see what the future has in hold for us. Yeah, because if you look at the last few big votes, if you like Brexit, everybody expected the UK to re remain, and, and they didn't. They voted in large favor of leaving. The, the, the US election was, it was early, early on. You could tell Trump was going to win. Um, the UK general election in the same way. You know, nobody envisaged David Cameron coming through as, as strongly as he did. I mean, is polling kind of dead now? I think it's evolving, and I'll say that. And people now have, they're used to having their own voice on social media. They're used to uh, changing and getting inundated with information. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I think we'll learn a lot. Some of those answers aren't done. I don't think it's done yet, but the world of analytics is, is probably not where we think it is. So, Frank, I was out in the country last week. I was in Eastern Europe, actually, in Serbia. So talk me through what... Uh, the, the week and how it evolved in the newsroom and what, you know, what was the reaction from the industry? Well, sure. I, I think that when we did an informal poll of executives throughout the industry on Monday, uh, it was unanimously, the, the guess was that it was going to be Clinton, and most people guessed that it was going to be Clinton in the landslide. So there were some a lot very of... very senior people there, Richard Edelman, sure. and some other very senior leaders. Sure, and uh, people with access to a lot of data of how it might go. So, um, you know, there was a big surprise on Wednesday morning when it turned out the way it did. Um, that being said, I think that there was a very quick realization that um, a lot of both journalists, media people, consultants, um, data and survey people really need to get out of the big cities more to get in touch with, you know, red state America, as they call it, and to get in touch with a lot of the areas that voted for Trump more often. And that seemed to be one of the big takeaways in a lot of um, the talks we had with executives throughout the week. Another follow-up we did was just how it's going to change the public affairs world. And there are a lot of questions about that right now because Trump has taken so many different positions on everything throughout the campaign and even throughout the early days of his transition that it's hard to know what exactly the policy is going to be when it gets cemented. Um, so, you know, the public affairs pros in Washington are really taking a wait-and-see approach and trying to prepare themselves for everything as much as possible. And then there's the question that we looked at of what is the White House press corps going to look, look at and, and have to deal with in a Trump administration. And one of the big concerns they have is that they've been left behind a few times already uh, in terms of the protective press pool, as it's called, uh, which they're not happy about and they're hoping that changes. A lot of the media relations pros that we talked to who worked on campaigns in the past talk about how a president, no matter what it was like during the campaign, has to have a decent enough relationship with the press in the White House because at that point it's a matter of getting things done instead of uh, using them as a target, so to speak. And finally, there's the big question of who is going to be the next White House press secretary, which is really like the spot that I think PR people look at throughout the industry as, as being like the, the chief communicator out there in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, there are some favorites for that. We've talked about Sean Spicer, Jason Miller, the spokesperson for the Trump campaign. Uh, some people think Hope Hicks is in consideration. There's a whole list of names of people who might be in on that, uh, who might be in the mix on that. And so that's something that will probably emerge in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and we'll certainly keep you in touch with that at PRWeek.com. Finally, on this, Brett, um, Trump has said he wants to drain the swamp. You know, well, you say there might be a bump in public affairs, but in a way, the swamp maybe includes some of the lobbyists and public affairs consultants that have operated in that in that sector. What, what do you think draining the swamp is going to mean for PR? It's going to mean change, and I think change will go beyond public affairs. That every company, if you look at healthcare, or pick your sector. There's going to be a lot of change, and companies are going to need strategy and navigation on how to deal with that. So regardless of what the final verdict is on public affairs and who can lobby under what time frame, uh, the issues managers are going to come quickly and swiftly. Do you think that if there is a lobbying ban, mm -hmm. say there is, and, and, a, and a real lobbying ban on public officials, say for five years, do you think PR firms actually benefit from that because these folks need to work someplace and might as well be at an agency? It's possible. I think when, when we talk about banning, again, the, the devil is going to be in the detail. What does that mean? Does that mean right. I can still consult? I just can't lobby? So when we talk about that from a macro standpoint, there's so much detail that needs to come out. But yeah, 
could the agency world be engulfing some of these people? Absolutely. I mean, anytime there's a political change in the White House, there's a lot of people out there looking for their next job. All right, so another election-related story, New Balance um, footwear brand got involved in the terms of sort of endorsing Trump in a certain way and really have taken a lot of heat for that, especially on social media. Brett, what, what, what's the lesson there? I mean, is, should brands get involved in the political process? You know, we've seen brands in the past like Starbucks and, and Apple and others, you know, get involved and make statements and, and do, do things with, you know, from a political standpoint. What, what do you, what's your take on that in light of the New Balance uh, yeah. scenario? I, I think it's a very delicate line they're walking in, in uh, endorsing a, a, any candidate for that matter who, when the popular vote is hovering around 50%. I mean, I think New Balance has a very interesting story. They do make shoes in America. They have five factories. The messaging I would be pushing out at that front would be a little bit different. And that, that part of the story is getting buried right now, too. So while people are burning New Balance shoes, there is sort of this Americana storyline that they should be promoting. So you could start to question the initial strategy they come out of the gate with. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Good point. Indeed. When I was looking at how they responded, I, I thought that they, and, and no one's questioning that they have the right to feel however they feel right. on, um, on trade policy. But what I think a lot of people found disappointing was that once <laughs> groups of neo-Nazis got involved, they didn't stand up quite as strongly as a lot of people thought they should have. And, and I, it looked to me like that was one area where they just got too caught up in the election to actually see the big picture. Well, it's funny in the apparel sector, and I spent a lot of time there, there there's been there's a long history of manufacturing and issues around it. So when they went down this road, they knew it was a slippery slope to begin with. There's decades of history of other brands that have, have had issues around this. Yeah, it just proves once again, if we needed uh, that proving, that uh, going anywhere you know, on social media with any sort of views like that, you've got to be very careful and, and really think it through properly. And Really, on, more on that subject, Frank, the fake news sites yeah. have been sort of blamed almost for costing Hillary Clinton the election, um, and it's been a bit of an issue. And w what's what's the take on that? What's the, the thinking around that? Well, you know, one thing really that big an issue? One thing that's really interesting is, I, and you just said blamed, but um, a guy who's purveyor of fake news was interviewed in the Washington Post this morning and, and was really almost taking credit for Trump's victory, saying, I'm, I'm the reason Donald Trump is going to president. So uh, I think it is a big deal. I think that the statistics that have come out in the past week that show that fake news has actually been shared more on Facebook than real news has is, is I mean, it's really terrifying if you work in our industry. Um, but I think there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of implications for Brett, your side of the fence as well, and that, um, you know, reputation management both for social media companies and for other companies, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when you have 40% plus of U.S. adults getting information from Facebook, this comes into a reputation management for Facebook. Just like traditional media outlets have reputation management and, and protect that very strongly, the red flag for me is Facebook and, and how they protect their reputation. Because while my, MySpace may have been uh, taken out because of evolutions in technology or how their site was designed, ultimately they had a reputation issue that started to diminish the value of that brand. Yeah, and Facebook always claims it's not a media company, doesn't it? Which uh, <laughs> is an interesting position to try and defend. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just as just for the, the lay person, what is fake news, Frank? I mean, it's not spoof news. Is no, it? I wouldn't say it's spoof lots news. of different and, types of. Uh, and it's content. not what you. Would, it's not satire. It's not what you would see on you know the Daily Show, or it's yeah, not yeah. even you know like snarky uh, tweets or anything like that. I mean, it's. Um, Websites that, and you can tell sometimes, are very cheesy looking that are set up to mis deliberately mislead people. Um, you know, like the one about uh, Donald Pope. Trump winning the. Well, I didn't see the one about the, the Pope endorsing anybody. I didn't see that one. But the one about. He endorsed uh, Donald Trump. That's why he won the election, actually. Well, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, kind of hard to believe on that one. Yes, but, um, I would agree. But if you, look at the, if you look at the one that said Donald Trump won the popular vote, that was traced back to something like 70news.com. We just went back to that site and that was not a news site, you can say. Yeah, right? it's fairly obvious when to, you, you to make it safe click through. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, some of them are more obvious than others, is, is the catch behind it. I yeah, I guess the issue, Brett, for clients that you, you're working on behalf of is how do you make, I mean, you know, Target had people mm -hmm. pretending to be Target employees and, or, or pretending to be Target's customer service 
division. And so it's a, how do you make sure that you are one authentic and real on Facebook or any other social media, but also how do you track and make sure that people are not putting things out about you that are not true or that pretending to be you? Yeah, and the monitoring of the news and, and the issues is, is a 24-7. That, that will keep uh, our industry uh, busy for a long it's time. Well. So obviously there, there are tools and, and evolutions that are happening that are helping brands do that too, but uh, it is a full-time job. Okay, let's go on to the NFL. Um, they've had a, a sticky start to the season, I suppose, with TV ratings falling quite significantly. And um, Brett, that's an area you know really well, sure. especially from your time at Catalyst, but uh, just generally... And um, is it just a, a, a slightly off season, if you like, where the games haven't been that great and the teams haven't been that high profile? Or is there a longer term problem here for the NFL and the broadcasters who pay a lot of money for those endorsements? You know, are people getting fed up with some of these, um, these issues, these behavior of some of the athletes, the whole thing about the health and the concussion, et cetera, et cetera? Is this drop in ratings an effect of that, or is this just a blip? I think the NFL brand is is beyond powerful. It's the most powerful sports entity in, in North America, and I think what they've done and will continue to do will lead that pack. I think there's a gravitational pull on everything we do, so the ratings can only go up for so long until there's a pull. Now, they've had some wind in their face in terms of a lot of news. Obviously, we just talked about that, so they're competing with that just like everyone else, but I do think what they will probably need to look at is there's a law of diminishing return, and when you add games on Thursday and Sunday morning when they're in other countries, and then you still have your, your 1 o'clock, your 4 o'clock Easterns, and your Monday night game, eventually there's a law of diminishing return. And I think some of the play, especially on Thursday night, maybe not have met the standards that they're accustomed to, but the NFL is a very smart organization, and I would never bet against them. I, I really agree with you on that, and that I think that I was saying to somebody the other day, I, I enjoyed football a lot more younger and it wasn't this all-encompassing never-ending thing right. which it, it feels like now at times when it was mostly just Sunday at one and Sunday at four you know um, but I think that if you look at the Thursday night games a lot of them have been really bad and really sloppy games because I mean if you know if you know the rhythm that football is supposed to be played and practiced in where you know you know your rest days and then Wednesday Thursday and Friday are your heavy practice days you're talking about only letting teams practice once or once a week and shows when they go and they play Thursday night without all that practice yeah. time. Yeah, it's a big part of the game, isn't it? So soccer's not going to take over yet. Not quite yet. No. But Premier League ratings were down this year, too. Okay. At least here. That's probably because Manchester United is struggling. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you had to get biggest, that in, right? Biggest, <laughs> biggest, su biggest supporter base in the world. You know. we're, we're, we're in a bit of a low ebb at the moment. All right, listen, Brett, thank you for joining us. Been thank great you, guys. I appreciate it. And thank you, Frank. Um, if you were uh, watching, uh, listening to us, uh, don't forget our Hall of Fame dinner, which takes place on December the 5th in New York City. Come and celebrate the industry. Come and celebrate all the, uh, some of the great legends of the industry. And do make sure you are getting, working on your brand film festival entries. That, those are out uh, for submissions at the moment. And that's a great uh, initiative that we've now expanded globally. So we've got Brand Film Festival New York and the Brand Film Festival London both out submissions now. But that's all we've got time for. We'll see you next time on the PR Week.